Okay, let's uh, kick this thing off. Um, all right, good morning everyone um, and welcome to our San Diego Design Week presentation for Bridging Communities. Um, I want to start off just by thanking the San Diego Design Week team. Um, they've done just such a stellar job putting together this um, event this week. Um, I know it took a lot of coordination to put something like this together. Um, I think we're all kind of looking forward to the, the rest of the events and um, future San Diego Design Week. So huge thanks to, to everyone working on that team. Um, my name is Tony Salamone. I'm a licensed architect and resident of Ocean Beach. I also work for Architect Santa Gabriel Wells, um, which is also located in Ocean Beach. Um, and I'm also going to be the moderator for this presentation. Um, um, our program today, we're just going to kind of, we're gonna, we're gonna do some brief introductions and then we're going to start a, a little video that this um, team um, worked really hard kind of putting together. Um, and then we're gonna open it up to uh, discussion at the end. Um, we want this to be more of a, of a kind of a community discussion about the, the exciting potential of this um, sort of project. Um, so just some, some quick Zoom etiquette before we get started is I'd, I'd like to ask all of you to mute yourself um, uh, to devo uh, avoid any kind of uh, distractions um, during the, the event. Um, and then also to keep your, your video off just to kind of keep the, the bandwidth um, towards the, the movie so it's, it's choppy and clear for everyone else or um, um, less choppy, I should say. Um, so yeah, with that said, let's let's kick this thing off, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pass this over to Mr. Jim Gabriel. Great. Well, hello. Uh, I also want to say thank you uh, to everyone, and and thanks for joining our Bridging Communities event. Um, it's it's an exploration of a possible connection between Ocean Beach and Mission Beach, um, and it's it's really encouraging for our team. Uh, and exciting to see that there's this many people interested and in attending the event. As Tony said, uh, we're really looking forward to some shared conversation after we do a, a short presentation. Our project for Bridging Communities is really, it's really the beginning of an idea. It's meant to inspire further study and exploration, which means we're not really presenting solutions but instead, we're, we're discussing opportunities and benefits of a project like this. Well, to get going, uh, as Tony mentioned, we'll do some introductions for each of the members of our collaboration team, and then we'll roll into the presentation. I'm Jim Gabriel. I'm a partner at Architects Hannah Gabriel Wells uh, here in Ocean Beach. And there, there are kind of two things that have really drawn me to this project. First, as, as a business owner here in Ocean Beach, many of our employees, they live within the, the Mission Bay region, you know, Mission Beach, Ocean Beach, Pacific Beach. And so we constantly find ourselves discussing ways to improve, enhance, make better all the spaces throughout this area. So the bridging communities idea seemed like a natural fit. Secondly, I just have a love of cities and the infrastructure that makes them work. And maybe more importantly, uh, is an interest in trying to improve that infrastructure to make it something more than just efficient and utilitarian and functional. An infrastructure that can really inspire and expand our, our entire living experience. You know, think of the Highline Park in New York or the Sundial Bridge up in Reading. These are the kind of projects that inspire my interest in this idea. Hi folks, my name is John Ambert. I'm an architect and sustainability professional with Studio Verde. I was the previous chair of the Ocean Beach Planning Board. And I'm really interested in this project for two main reasons. One, for creating a uniform boardwalk along the coastline that connects Ocean Beach to Mission Beach and beyond. And two, to really create a sustainable solution that enhances our community reduces the carbon footprint of transportation between our communities and protects the surrounding environment. 
And good morning, everyone. My name is JT Barr. I'm a principal and partner at Schmidt Design Group. We're a landscape architecture and planning firm, uh, also located on the peninsula in Point Loma. Uh, I myself am also a resident of the peninsula here in Point Loma. And you know, when, when Jim and the Hannah Gabriel Wells team approached me about this, this dialogue and this concept, uh, it's something that I was immediately drawn to both as a professional and a, as a resident. This is such a unique opportunity to um, connect those, those missing gaps within our communities and to reinforce connectivity and um, really to create a new opportunity to uh, share the incredible landscape that we have, this beautiful coastal landscape of San Diego with the community and, and creating both a conduit and a destination. Steve, you're muted. Of course, that was going to happen. Hi, um, I'm Steve Merritt. I'm at KPFF. I'm a structural engineer. And uh, anytime I get to work with these guys and um, on, on a structure that's going to be exposed and that's, that's going to be tangible uh, to the community, to my children, to my family, to your family, that's, that's something that makes me extra excited. Um, I've, I've lived in PB. I spend a lot of time in OB now with my family. And it, it just, it, it would be so great to, to see those tied together. And my name is Taylor Masick. I'm a designer with architect Hannah Gabriel Wells here in Ocean Beach. And I'm excited to join the conversation because uh, just I love talking about elevating the San Diego experience. Uh, the talk we're about to have, I mean, we talk about enhancing our San Diego outdoor culture, our sustainability goals. And I think we're all excited to do it within design week because this part of the design process is something that is usually hidden from a lot of people and with the video we're about to share with you um, you're seeing how architects and designers and engineers collaborate from the very beginning you're going to see our very first meeting together our very first site visit and with this meeting I mean, I think this is probably our third or fourth meeting together as a team. And so we're able to pull all of you into that as well and really get the discussion going with more people and share it with everybody who's, uh, who's here. So that's really exciting for us. And so that being said, I mean, as, as you watch our video, please start to comment, start to ask questions. And after the video, we hope to get a good discussion going, hear your guys' feedback and talk about the next steps. So with that being said, I am going to be the one sharing the video here. Hello and welcome everyone to our Design Week project, Bridging Communities. I'm Jim Gabriel, a partner with architects Hannah Gabriel Wells, right here in Ocean Beach, and a passionate supporter of a beach-to-beach -beach bridge link, an idea I've been thinking about ever since moving here back in the mid-80s. Our presentation explores a simple idea, connecting Ocean Beach to Mission Beach across Hospitality Point. Three important locations spanned by two bridges, connecting and enhancing our regional culture. The site is a beautiful intersection of waterways, bike paths, and parkland. However, there are no connections for people to move between these wonderful areas. And this is the very point of our project to suggest that there should be a connection Joining me in our discussion are J.T. Barr, landscape architect, John Ambert, architect and community supporter, Steve Merritt, structural engineer, and my two colleagues, Taylor Masick and architect Tony Salamone. We began by meeting out at the site on the Ocean Beach side of the San Diego River. We made our way around to hospitality and mariner points discussing 
experiencing and documenting. And the following are highlights of our discussion organized along a possible pathway. Hope you all enjoy. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a no-brainer to me. This is a great idea. A lot of San Diego history, I think, is centered right in this area. So it's just a perfect spot for a landmark. This whole right. area would be become a new hangout for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. And I think that's the that's the important sort of additional layer of narrative to this. It's a conduit, but it's also a destination. It's it's an opportunity to create those people places, those pause points, those social spaces, those educational spaces to to create activation in addition to movement. Yeah, we got to start rebuilding that infrastructure that's about people and about you know the experiences we get to have. It's the natural place to start because it's a good wide spot and it's at the intersection of the existing bike path running along the river to Dog Beach and the dead end of Bacon Street, which a lot of people are using to head into downtown Ocean Beach. This might become a great little hub for a, you know, a little bike shop, bike shop cafe, bike shop brewery, but, you know, just some, some little activity node right there. Yeah, and, and the, the connection across the San Diego River portion is really that opportunity to to have something that is more low profile and what that allows is a simpler construction, but it also provides a more direct connection and access, access to such a ecologically rich area. It'd be neat if there were a link, uh, some terraces or some way that a person could literally wander the the, the sandbar and walk right up to the bridge or vice versa is just to the east of where we're proposing the bridge is one of the um, top birding sites in all of the west coast yeah. so it's almost like i mean if you are there to bird watch you know maybe you can get some of the birds that are going to come right up onto the bridge as well you know absolutely yeah yeah, it becomes a living structure yeah. where we're adjacent to an ecological preserve. It's you know, it's really about celebrating the environment, the context that we're in, within and mm -hmm. allowing that to express itself on the bridge itself. Right. What is that little triangle shaped park? I don't know if I've ever been to that. It, the park is a little bit of a <laughs> hidden spot in San Diego, you know? It feels underutilized and yeah. it would seem like this connection that goes through linking these together would really energize and yeah. all of a sudden it would have direct positive impacts to be able to bring some activation to that area would would be valuable i could see that it's kind of like an elevated park that that intersects with that mid-span abutment this becomes sort of an elevated experience and rolls down and and connects to grade. So it feels like the bridge is growing out of the landscape. Actually, there could be some neat opportunities there. Imagine if, if that was actually oriented towards the the space here, almost like a interpretive center for the river mm, or right. something tucked underneath. And then this is sloping up over the top of it. When we stood out on Hospitality Point, it had a pretty nice view, right? We were, oh, yeah. we were yeah. getting we were getting glimpses all the way out to the pier. You can see all the way to the mountains. You see downtown and that it pivots west all the way to the ocean. So it, it's really shows the, the full context of, of our landscape in San Diego. If you elevate that up, it just gets better and better. When the bridge connects to the north, does it span the parking? So you're landing in a, in a park-like setting, not into a parking lot. Think about what that would do if this park down here were actually sloped up. It would create this amazing amphitheater back into. The, oh yeah, that's back cool. into the little bay there. The northern half across the Mission Bay Channel has to be taller and probably operable to accommodate the boats, and that really presents an opportunity to create something monumental, something that people will picture when they think of San Diego. The it seems like a a you know arch up and over has the advantage of there's no moving parts right 
you know, to make it practical for someone on a bike, it would have to get really long. I, I think, and I think there's a, there's a, there's a happy nexus in there in, in the vertical grade change, one that accommodates what we're trying to accomplish from an access and a pedestrian and cyclist perspective that allows a vast majority of the recreational boats to pass under. And then for those larger masted vessels, having that operable component so that, that there are sort of scheduled times for passage and clearance. Something we talked about on site is, is sort of doing a, an environmental evaluation of you know, what it takes and, the, and the, the time it takes to bike from mission to OB relative to, to drive and what the carbon footprint is and what the calories burned are and sort of really creating a story yeah. around the mobility, the alternate mobility aspects of, of how great this can be. How many cars we can get off the road. Yep. There's bridges over the bay currently, right? But they're not somewhere you want to stop and, and enjoy the bay. You have cars flying by behind you, creating something like this that's pedestrian only. You can actually really stop and enjoy these places. Yeah, yeah. just imagine being on this bridge for the 4th of July. We're stitching these communities, but I think um, it's far more kind of intentional and almost phenomenological in that sense in these like sensory experiences that it's more about the experience of crossing and not just like the destination, right? It's the, the, the lounging on the bridge, the view, the smell of the fireworks after they burst, right? Like the, the sea mist being floated like over that bay. Right? Like those are the types of qualities I think we need to convey. It's not just another like point A to point B connection. Understand the true value of the project and be able to demonstrate that value in ways other than costs. If it can touch on the climate action plan and have measurable goals that have carbon reduction. If it can come back to mobility to these parking spaces and give people opportunity to have more circulation routes and have more of the bicycle routes that the city is mandated to implement. Yeah, there's a ton of opportunities there. Chen, I think anybody that has yeah. a stake in our in our waterways yeah. and both coastal and river are are advocates that, that we want to engage and bring on board. It's got to get that backing to say we think this is important fundamental principle of community engagement is is about having a continual uh, evolving process that's a collective sort of path yeah i think i think that is absolutely key is is engaging everyone as a partner yep. and and once you develop a strategy that that hears everyone and uh, you know responds to everyone the design is just going to get better So let's um, let's open it up for discussion. Um, we have a few kind of questions to to kick this off, and maybe that will kind of develop a, a dialogue that might spark um, others to feel free to to keep adding questions to this. Um, I know there's kind of a lot to to unpack, um, and it's it's super nuanced. So um, we're going to do our best to to kind of uh, answer some of these questions, but we don't necessarily have the solutions. It just kind of comes from. Um, from you as the community members and also kind of designers um, that we want your feedback. Um, so it's, it's super important. So um, let's start with, um, I, I knew this was going to be the, the first question uh, <laughs> from uh, uh, R. George Hellman. After overruns, please estimate money paid to those building it and externalized greenhouse gas emitted by those using it. And I think we could probably tie that into, you know, 
how much is this thing going to cost? So let, yeah, let's, let's kick it off with the most loaded question here, <laughs> a, th a three, a three parter. Um, uh, I, you know, I think, I, I don't know who wants to comment on this, but we had a little slide. This was asked before we had that, that kind of greenhouse gas, um, emission slide. I don't know if, if Taylor, if you can even pull that up or it, does anyone know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Uh, I can try, but um, I would continue the discussion in the meantime. Yeah, maybe we start with yeah. how much it might cost. Well, yeah, listen, cost is uh, is always one of the, the the big important topics, just like um, feasibility and logistics, and um, the, and and every one of these is is uh, an item that can be developed, researched. Uh, thought through properly, and you put together a a reasonable plan for for accomplishing those goals. So, as we said, this is the inception of an idea. Um, do we know what the cost is? Of, of course not at this point, because there's not even really a a a project yet. But but the cost would be part of developing a a real solution. Uh, it would have to have parameters put on it and it would have to be something that people find the benefits. Um, I think John, I'm going to let John talk to this, but there are, it's important to remember there are, there are benefits other than cost benefits. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the greenhouse gas component of this find that it's a substantial reduction operational carbon that's used by public transportation. Um, we haven't put together a greenhouse gas estimate for the cycling has one of the largest impacts on carbon reduction for transportation purposes. And that's kind of what the slide was uh, mentioning in the video. Um, and then also the um, embodied energy or the embodied carbon that goes on with the construction of the bridge and the materials that are used as a part of it that also would be accounted for. We want to see reductions of both operational carbon and embodied carbon to ensure the bridge had a maximum impact uh, on the environment. So these things are require much further study. And as we're in the initial phases of this, uh, we're considering this and we're prioritizing it, but we'd have to do a much more in-depth uh, research project to understand the true impact on greenhouse gases. Yeah. I uh, we were prepping for for this question, and um, I joked that it's going to cost half as much as the value that it provides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that that I think that's that's the essence of it right there, is is you know, keeping your eye on the fact that this is adding value to our community, potentially for generations, um, and that that's part of thinking about the cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, maybe this ties into to the next question, which is, um, uh, you know, why have another bridge if there is one further down the river, river? So, I mean, I think most people are familiar with this area that there there is another um, pedestrian slash cyclist slash, I mean, it's mainly automotive just um, just east of this bridge. So, so why should we um, build this? Uh, I'll, I'll start with this one. I think that uh, JT uh, handled that pretty well when at the start of our video when he said this bridge as a pedestrian and bicycle bridge is more than just a conduit, right? It's more than just getting from A to B. It's more about placemaking. It's about creating an experience for San Diego and creating a new destination. Um, so this particular location, which is at this confluence of Mission Beach and Ocean Beach, and then you have the San Diego River and you have the, the bay, you know, and there's so much activation already in this spot of people um, hanging out and doing what we do in San Diego, you know, our outdoor culture, that this is the perfect location to create an experience rather than um, just another another conduit. And and I think we, as as a society, have a history of of sort of bolt-on infrastructure the road is always the dictates the solution and so 
I think we want to think beyond that and create a, an experience that truly is pedestrian and bicycle centric. Yeah, I, I would, I would second that. I, I think the bridges that exist uh, throughout the valley, they're all really part of big automotive arterial, you know, collector roads. Um, they are not about people or bikes or experience. They are just about efficiently moving cars and trucks. Um, and, and they certainly do not connect communities. And that's, that was an essential part of what we were trying to do here is form real connections between communities for people uh, first and, um, and, and start to prioritize that in our thinking as, as a city. Yeah, and to the point of where this bridge is located, it is bridging to areas that are not currently connected. The bridge to the east is taking people more towards Mission Bay and towards uh, Pacific Beach. And this would be a direct linkage from coast to coast. You can imagine a single boardwalk that goes all the way across the coastline here. This is really the direct pathway, the most direct pathway between two areas that are currently disconnected. Yeah, and I think it's it's a proven area of heavy <clears throat> of of heavy pedestrian activity on both sides. A lot of times there's there's talks about putting a bridge in because it it it's a natural link between areas, but it's not always as obvious of a of a need as it is here because there's already thousands of people that are just bumping their you know bumping their walks at the end of each side of that and then turning around and going back. And so, you know, true. so I think so I think it's it it's a it's a guaranteed going to get thousands of people a day type of bridge. Mm -hmm. Cool, okay. Um, here's a more, I suppose, ecological question, if you call it that. Has the design team considered the feral cat colony that lives on the jetty? Uh, I wonder if they would use the bridge to migrate into either OB or Mission Beach, smiley face. So <laughs> not sure if that's, uh, if, if you want, the uh, the feral cats into OB or Mission Beach. I can see that being a problem, but look, I'm a cat owner, uh, a huge cat fan here. Uh, I mean, I love all animals, and I think that the discussion has to be more about right the 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 larger ecological implications of building a bridge in this location, and and specifically kind of the the animal life that's here. So we, you know, like John said, like we haven't done any sort of extensive research. Um, into how this would impact um, the the animal community and, and plant life in this, but we want i mean that 's of utmost importance is to to ensure that um, the animals have a safe path of of potentially crossing or of of habitation so i don 't know if anyone else has any sort of response on just animal and plant life in general and not not necessarily specific to the feral cat community but <laughs> Um, you know, this, this connection is so unique in that we're bridging two distinctly different types of ecologies. You know, one is truly, you know, a, a marine ecology that's, that's within the bay. And then we have the San Diego River, which has the estuary uh, and the coastal dunes and the, the habitat preserved there. And, and it absolutely requires a lot more study. But I think the objective that we've continually thought about is, is how to be as sensitive as possible while also creating access. To, to have the ability to create access builds understanding, builds stewardship, builds appreciation. And so the more that we're able to connect uh, the users to that sensitive ecology and tell that story, the more appreciation that we'll establish over time. Right, yeah, I think um, there's not as many places as a lot of us would like to go down and touch the San Diego River and experience that as residents. And so this just presents a great opportunity to create something where everyday residents, tourists, and I mean, classrooms of kids can go down there and start to interact with that estuary and, um, and uh, experience it. Cool. Okay. Um, okay, we have uh, a question here from Tyler Wallace. Um, I think he, he left early, but he wanted to mention this. Um, the boats would cross too often that it would interrupt the use of the bridge too much and be a, a logistical problem. If someone wants to go sailing, they don't want to have to plan around times the bridge is open. 
Can the bridge extend to the west or east for a length to get enough elevation before traveling north or south? And I think there's a few questions concerning the, the, the operable bridge here. So I think that's a really great question. Yeah, no, that's, that, that occupied quite a bit of our uh, discussion uh, as a group. And, um, and, and I think if, if a project like this were continued to be researched and developed, uh, that would be a, a really critical aspect of it. Um, we do want to ensure that the activities of Mission Bay and the boat channel and the mariners are, are respected and um, whether that is a bridge that goes up and over, a bridge that uh, has an operable component, I think that would be the, the point of the research and the point of the outreach to, you know, the, the groups that operate the marinas and the size of the, of the sailboats and the mass that they keep in there. And, um, so there's, there's a big learning curve ahead of all this. Um, the nice thing is uh, all these problems have been um, dealt with all over the world. And so there are solutions. There are really great proven solutions. It's about researching, working with the community, and finding the best solution for our particular application. Okay, um, you know, and maybe may, maybe I'll tie it into this. This question will kind of come down to this one by uh, Chris. Why would you need to have the bridge raise and lower when the vehicle roads do not raise uh, today? And I think that also kind of uh, that ties into Scott's question here. What would be the necessary slope to match the vertical clearance of the West Mission Bay Drive bridge? Um, how many? Uh, you know, this is, this is a this is a three parter here. Let's start with just the necessary slope yeah. to match the vertical clearance. Yeah. Well, I, so you mentioned the existing bridges that are currently over the bay. I think those, depending on the tide, run between thirty five feet or so, maybe a little less. But the the thing is, is um, there actually is a um, place for boats to come in before they cross the bridge at Quiverera Basin there, um, just beyond Hospitality Point. So right now there is a spot for very large vessels to come in there. I don't know the exact max that they allow, but this would all, all um, would impede all of a sudden that. So we would either have to come up with a pretty good, I mean, th there is a max slope that we would want to do to make it convenient. And so the bridge would have to get very long or become operable. Um, obviously through studies, we could figure out which one is the better option. Um, but I, I, I mean, I, I'm not too worried about it. I think, I think there's plenty of cities that have done bridges just like this very successfully. I mean, especially over in Europe. I mean, there's operable bridges on rivers all over the place. So um, it's a very uh, achievable goal. Yeah, you know, and it, it could almost be a, a feature that the, the pedestrians get to watch this operable bridge turn or lift or something like twice an hour or, or something of that nature. And it's a, it's, it's not a bad view to be, you know, to be forced to pause at, right? Yeah. Right. And the, and the question does raise a, a great point in that, you know, we are creating a, a pedestrian and bike connection. So, you know, that is, that is an essential consideration uh, when we think about the span and the elevations and, and how we're able to comfortably accommodate that that movement because most again most all of our bridges are um, sloped based on you know sort of vehicular needs and not always taking into consideration the pedestrian experience or slopes so you know this is an opportunity where again it, it becomes that pedestrian and cycle first approach Yeah, and then, um, I, you know, I don't know if we have a number on how many boats based in the bay that would limit and what might be a reasonable um, expected interval for a high clearance mechanism if unmanned or what might be a mechanism by which high masted ships could request passage similar to the locks of, say, Erie Canal. Um, 
you know, that, that would again take um, some extensive research, research on just the boat timing itself, but also looking at some of the precedents of other city, whether you do you reduce the boat um, amount or does it not impede it at all? Yeah, right. I, I guess the, the, you know, what the point we're trying to make is uh, it, it, we, we don't have a solution for this. And, um, and it, it's more, it's an idea we think is worth looking into. I guess that's really the point of, of, our, of our event today is um, we, we do think the idea is interesting. We think it's worth uh, getting support to further investigate it. And, um, and there may be uh, roadblocks to this idea that are just immovable roadblocks, but we, we think it's, um, there's some amazing opportunities and it, and it should be looked at and, and you never know. Maybe there is a solution that uh, accommodates uh, all interest and that would be the best of all solutions. Um, so we're not saying you have to have an operable bridge or a giant flyover. Uh, we're just saying we should, we should really look into it. You, you mentioned uh, the opportunities, Jim, and I think that one of the opportunities presented by this particular problem is the fact that this would either have to be a larger bridge than normal or an operable bridge is that it's, it's got to be kind of cool. You know, it's, it, it's something that could create an icon for the city of San Diego, something that is more than just a standard bridge, something that people think about when they think of San Diego, um, something that attracts tourists, which would bring in money, you know, something that the residents are proud of. So um, I, I think uh, that's just an opportunity to create a new piece of architecture or infrastructure for San Diego. Okay, um, here's a question, B. Perkins. I wonder how the bridge could help to create and sustain uh, ecological habitat as well as become a tool to research and monitor habitat in the long term. Can the bridge somehow record ecological activity and data? Is there opportunity to juxtapose an interactive art or science museum research facility open to interaction with the public combining science and learning with uh, sensorial experienced and spirit of place. Great question. That's, and just a really good design idea. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I second the motion. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's unanimous. Yeah. I, from a, from an ecological perspective, it's something that we had talked about uh, as a team from the start of the process is that this is not just a bridge. It's a living bridge. And so there's this confluence of infrastructure and landscape and, and ecology that, that connect to one another. So are there opportunities? We certainly believe there are opportunities to pull the, the plant material of the, the dunes into the bridge and to blur those lines, uh, which ultimately would, uh, I think, encourage habitat. And again, create those opportunities for, for people to have more more intimate connections with the nature that's around them. I think I think the the three the three uh, nodes that are being connected are all three opportunities to um, to locate a a visitor center to locate a a space where you could gather up classes for discussions or to do research. So. Uh, yeah, I think the, the opportunities for integration uh, of the environment and the study of the environment yeah. are, are perfectly in tune with, with this thinking. Yeah, we had talked about different ways of making the bridge as a teaching tool. Maybe it's something that helps to monitor tide. Maybe it's something that evaluates sun and where the sun lands. Uh, maybe it's something that promotes ecology and supports ecology onto the bridge. Uh, ton of opportunities for students, academics, visitors, and educators to participate in a actively, uh, in an active build and an active teaching setting. And also, I think I want to tie this into another comment, um, you know, utilizing biomimicry as a design cue and making that 
um, you know, living natural systems as the thing that helps to define what the bridge is, both from an experience standpoint and a learning standpoint. Very important values that we have considered and would like to explore more. Well said, yeah. John. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, like Jim was saying, we have these three nodes that we're connecting and they're already active places. But I think that as a group, when we went out there, we really realized that while they're already active, there's so much opportunity to enhance them either even further, right? There's so many, I mean, the interpretive center or whatever it is that we can kind of put in there as well. And so, um, yeah, I think there's plenty of opportunity to, to do this. Um, okay, cool. Uh, we've got a question from Scott. How would future transit expansions uh, be able to utilize the bridge for intermodal non-car transportation? Do you see potential for a future light rail stop in the Rob Field area serving both OB, MB, and the areas uh, into Pacific Beach otherwise not accessible by future rail network addition? Thanks to this potential connection. I could jump in on this one first. Um, you know, we've been vying for some sort of light rail connection to the beach communities for decades. And I think that working with the city to facilitate that uh, beyond the five freeway uh, has been rather difficult. But with that said, I do really feel strongly about the connection from the light rail, future light rail stop in Claremont, uh, or maybe there's an additional light rail stop that could come a little bit further south along the different uh, channel pathways that we're talking about in order to facilitate that kind of crossing with a uh, non-vehicular mode transport. Um, it is something that would be external, but it is something that we could definitely consider as a, as a way to encourage uh, non-vehicular transportation to the bridge. Right, and as I understand it, at one point in time, there was a trolley that went out to Ocean Beach, is that correct? That's correct, and yeah. And there was a bridge that crossed the channel at one point in time as well. So there was, yeah. Yeah. Part part of our discussions when we were on site were you know, talking about you know the continual evolution of of movement and circulation and transportation and you know by by connecting these communities is there a new opportunity much like rickshaws are used in the gas lamp corridor is there is there an alternate way to move people through this corridor that that can be done in a much more sustainable way um okay so on uh kind of switching gears uh b perkins has i believe it is an important to consider possible effects of gentrification on the surrounding communities how do we make sure to implement something that will have a high social impact without displacing current residents? Yeah, um, that's super loaded and, and relevant to, to a lot of the kind of development that's occurring right now. So great question. I think you're seeing gentrification occur all along the coastline naturally. Um, as population grows and housing supply grows less rapidly, you're always gonna see high demand and high costs to coastal properties. So gentrification is just a natural element that happens in coastal communities and making connection points that don't allow vehicular transportation, those would foster social connection. So in this way, I personally feel that a pedestrian connection would probably deal with gentrification in a positive way. It would allow people to unify in uh, their single mode of transport or multi-mode transportation using bikes or their legs essentially to get across this bridge. Um, I think the connection points between the nodes, those would definitely see uh, further economic development as a part of this. And that economic development might ripple out around those areas uh, in which they touch down. But ultimately I think that any type of pedestrian or uh, bicycle connection networks are positive uh, impacts on gentrification and not negative ones. And as a, uh, a lifetime resident of these beach communities, I completely agree. I remember 10 years ago, I used to be able to come and park in Ocean Beach anytime. These days, it's really hard to find a parking spot around this area. So, I mean, living over in Crown Point, working over in Ocean Beach, it would be so nice to have this bridge to be able to come back and forth. Um, yeah between the two communities as a, as a resident. 
Yeah. And, and John, I think touched on a, a great point in that uh, the three touch points of what is being proposed are all open space and zoned as open space. So the project isn't introducing displacement as a part of, of creating these improvements and connections. Um, okay. Uh, it's, you know, 1053 now. So maybe we, we answer just a couple more questions. Um, quickly here. Let's see. Is there another option to just not care at all about the tall sailboats? How much will we spend just to allow a handful of boats to not have to dock at San Diego Bay instead? Yeah. I, I, um, I think that is a, a good fundamental question there. We, you know, Quivera Basin, it exists. It houses a, a number of boats. Uh, tall masted boats um, and uh, Mariner's Cove has Anchorage uh, as well for, for masted boats. But I think it's probably worth a regional look uh, with, with the maritime community uh, because you wonder what percentage that really makes up of all the portage um, when you take in San Diego Bay as, as part of that. And uh, I think there is, at least for discussion purposes, there, there is a, an idea where you limit mast height into Mission Bay and you say tall masted boats over a certain height uh, use uh, San Diego Bay for Anchorage. And, uh, and, and that may be feasible. And, and it may be practical uh, as a way of simplifying the connections and making these bridge links um, much more practical. So I, I think it would be a discussion item. Cool, okay. Um, I wanna end it off maybe on just this last question um, is maybe just more of kind of like a, a call to action. And that is to put this bridge um, into perspective in terms of a timeline. So, you know, how long will something like this take to build? And, you know, what, what do we need to do as a community to, um, to, to, to create something like this. Well, yeah. Well, you're, I don't know, you're probably looking what five, 10 year type of process. Uh, we're talking about infrastructure, infrastructure projects uh, always have long timelines because they touch so many different areas and they have to engage with so many different agencies, communities, um, and they have to thoughtfully work through each and every one of those design problems uh, in order to, to reach a, a, a consensus and have a, a you know, well thought through design. So the process will take time. And uh, of course it's incremental. That process starts with uh, a feasibility study. And then from a feasibility study, it would, it would grow into focused studies into specific target areas. And, and so uh, it's, it's about initiating the idea, hopefully today, and, and seeing if there's a way to carry that forward with uh, community groups, council, SANDAG, uh, and, and see if we can build support for taking it to that next step, taking it to a feasibility stage. Cool. All right. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it puts it in perspective that if, if we really want to see this, this change happen um, along the coast in San Diego, we, we really have to start now. So I think as a community, we really need to kind of to, to come together because these things take time. Um, otherwise, you know, if, if we start the process in five years, it's just delaying these types of projects that we want to see happen that really benefit the community of San Diego. So um, we all want to thank you very much for, for attending this. Um, if you want to continue the conversation, and I, I hope you do, you can um, follow us on at Bay2Beach, that's the number two, so at Bay2Beach SD. Um, that's on uh, Instagram and you can feel free to email the San Diego Design Week team and, and get our emails or contact information. Um, again, this is, this is a collaboration. We're by no means designing anything right now. We just wanted to um, kind of start the, start the conversation and get the ball rolling.
Um, so yeah, I don't know if anyone else has any, any kind of closing comments. If not, then, uh, yeah. Thank, thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone yeah, thank for you tuning everybody in. for your time. Thank you everyone. Yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank, thanks everyone for, for, uh, attending and, and taking some time out to, to, uh, think about this idea. So, uh, hopefully we'll keep the discussion going forward in the future. And, and we will get this recording somehow out to you. I don't know how someone asked that question, but it'll, it'll get to your email. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think so. This, this zoom session recording will go on, um, mm -hmm. the design week website and then our video will be posting that on YouTube or Vimeo shortly. So everyone has access to that as well. Cool. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. So much, everyone. Stay safe. See ya. Bye. Bye, -bye everyone. Take care.